Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this webinar on ecology and dredging. This is the second webinar organized by IADC. The first webinar um, is still available on the, on the website, and this webinar will also be made available on the website um, within a few days from now. Uh, at the end of our presentation, um, you'll have uh, the possibility to ask us some questions and which we'll hopefully be able to answer. And you can uh, do this by typing it in your screen. Today, Heidi van der Meij and myself will be uh, talking about the need and application of ecological knowledge um, in dredging projects. Heidi has a background in eco aquatic eco ecotechnology and works as an environmental engineer for Van Oort dredging and marine contractors. We met about 10 years ago um, when we were both working for Rotterdam Zoo here in the Netherlands. And independently of one another, we decided to work for competitive dredging contractors. But as ecologists, uh, we both know that competition doesn't exist. There is only cooperation. And therefore, I'm very happy that uh, Heidi was willing to co-host this webinar with me um, and that we have a chance to talk together about our passion for marine ecology um, today here in this setup. Thank you, Astrid. Astrid uh, Kramer is an ecologist working for Hydronamic, the in-house uh, engineering department of Poscalis. And uh, Astrid has been a project engineer on a worldwide uh, project, uh, challenging, ecological challenging project uh, all over the world. And thank you, Astrid, uh, for inviting me to do this uh, webinar with, together with me. Uh, before we talk about the need and application of eco ecological knowledge uh, within dredging projects, uh, it is perhaps good to, to know what we understand as, uh, as ecology um, and what we do not. Um, so let's start with that. Uh, this is just a short list, uh, which we uh, have heard from our beloved colleagues. Uh, uh, so ecology is not the urge uh, to make the life of cost estimators uh, um, uh, very difficult or um, picking flowers and laying in the field all day. Or ecology is not cuddling with uh, sea turtles or dolphins for that matter. Uh, I also think that it's not um, doing research just for the sake of doing research and spending money or it's and it's much more than sun tanning on a on a on a vessel doing water quality uh, monitoring but what is it then uh, ecology deals with a huge degree of variation in plant life and animal life and as we call um, biodiversity uh, and it's not only the study of these organisms um, the study uh, the the word the ecology comes from uh, oikos and logos, meaning uh, the study or laws of the house. Uh, ecology is um, uh, the scientific study of interactions between organisms and their environment. And an ecosystem is an assemblage of these uh, organisms and the environment uh, they live in, like uh, air, water or soil. And uh, they are connected through uh, nutrient cycles and energy flows. Uh, for example, coral reef is, is the most diverse, uh, one of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. Uh, we should keep in mind that all ecosystems uh, contain numerous animals uh, or organisms and uh, perhaps the majority of these organisms uh, are not seen by the naked eye, so under a microscope only. Um, each organism has its own task in the, in, uh, within the ecosystem and when we say organisms, uh, um, but we mean actually a summary of, of animals um, including humans, um, a plants, bacteria, fungi. So when organisms fulfill their task, uh, other organisms will be impacted if they uh, interface with each other. Um, they may occur within the same area or they provide food for uh, one another. Uh, organisms depend on each other and they, uh, they interact and um, this function therefore comes with a responsibility. Ecosystems are often um, represented as a hierarchy, uh, a pyramid, uh, with the uh, organisms that um, have a potential, potentially the biggest individual impact on top. Um, but this does not mean that this organism uh, on top is the most important species, because uh, when a lower species is, eliminate, is eliminated uh, due, due to uh, uh, natural or anthropogenic activities, such as storm, flooding, or, uh, or construction activities, uh, this can be catastrophic for, uh, for the whole ecosystem and thus for the organism on, on the top. So take for instance the bacteria in our intestine system. Uh, 
Uh, this is uh, flora, uh, these are microorganisms, and they live in uh, symbiosis with us. Um, they feed, uh, we feed them our food, and they, um, uh, in return, help us um, uh, break down our food. And it's an incredibly tiny um, um, organism, and if we miss them, it's not, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's a crappy situation uh, when these guys are gone. Um, also, uh, another um, example is a, is a coral reef, because coral uh, live in symbiosis uh, with an algae named Zosentelli, and the algae produces sugar and oxygen through photosynthesis, and the coral provides shelter and uh, carbon dioxide uh, to the algae. Um, the algaes are sensitive for reduction in light and uh, since they need this for photosynthesis um, and they are also um, uh, sensitive for seawater um, temperature increase and if the seawater temperature increases or the light reduces um, then the algae is expelled from the coral or it moves away and since the algae um, provides the coloring corals we see this as uh, bleaching and as a result of this bleaching, the coral um, will get less food, uh, sugars, um, that may lose, uh, the, and they may die from losing their partner. And when the corals die, uh, the fish, the crustaceans, the worms, and etc., that live in this thriving coral uh, reef, um, uh, they may leave, and with them, uh, the birds that hunt the fish, and so on. Uh, so indirectly, a small algae uh, plays an important role in a much larger area than a single coral colony. And um, there are many more of these interactions within coral reefs, but also, but also within other ecosystems. And this is ju just one example of this. So if we think it's already complex within one ecosystem, it gets even more complex when we look at the interactions between different ecosystems. When we study ecosystems, uh, the first thing we see is that everything is connected through water, um, rivers, oceans, groundwater, through air, soil, or directly. And it's really hard to say um, where one ecosystem stops and the next one begins. An impact on one location um, can and will probably impact something somewhere else at the distance. For example, um, a coral reef, um, it functions as a natural protective barrier for the coast, protecting it from wave impact, like a breakwater protects a harbor or a beach. A thriving, healthy coral reef um, is strong and flexible, but after bleaching, um, bleaching has occurred, uh, it becomes, the structure loses its integrity and it becomes brittle, more fragile. So due to the wave action, pieces of coral will break off and the whole area will turn into uh, a rubble, just dead pieces of coral. And yeah, the, uh, with this, the protective function also decreases. So the disappearing of a seemingly small and insignificant algae may lead to impacts on nearby ecosystems and the impacts on these ecosystems will lead to impacts on other ecosystems and so on. Another good example of this is the interrelatedness between mangroves, seagrasses, and corals. And as you can see on, on, on the pictures on the screen, um, many places on Earth we can find these three ecosystems in close proximity of each other. And depending on how far we, we zoom out or zoom in, uh, we can see that they basically function as one ecosystem. When the mangroves disappear, and you can see that in, in the picture in the bottom, um, for instance, as a result of felling timber, people collecting wood to make fires, erosion of the coast can take place, and this enhances the loss of mangroves even more. Um, additionally, sedimentation will increase. Um, this impacts the abundance of seagrass and its inhabitants, which are usually located quite close to the mangroves. and Reef fish, um, which use the seagrass and the roots of the mangroves to, um, for shelter when they're hatching, um, the, uh, they hatch, um, when, the, when the mangroves disappear, the seagrass will also diminish, and therefore the diversity and abundance of reef fish um, on the coral reef also reduces. So you see, it's hard to draw the line where one system ends and the other one starts. 
So <clears throat> what we do in practice, we usually zoom in on a physical area and we call that an ecosystem to be able to grasp it, to work with it, to study it, while in fact the relationships um, extend much further. And we should keep this in mind when we talk about impacts. So um, humans are part of the ecosystem as well. Um, the study ecology or biology uh, usually excludes um, humans. They don't talk a lot about humans, but we believe that um, humans are part of the ecosystem. Um, we're organisms. We interact with other organisms. Um, we eat or organisms. We have organisms in our in our body, as Heidi explained, in our gut system, um, help helping digesting our food, and we come across organisms when we're recreating. So we see ourselves as part of the ecosystem as well. And the way we are organized is therefore no different than, for example, a coral reef. It's exactly the same, and we're going to show you in the next slide. When we look at the structure of our society, we see so many similarities. Um, for instance, um, the corals, they, um, they secrete an external skeleton, um, calcium carbonate, and in that in that skeleton, the, the animal lives. It protects it from yeah, dangers from the outside. Well, we do exactly the same. We build a house, and we hide in there to escape the cold, um, yeah, other things. Um, we have different kind of houses. We have tall buildings, uh, flats, or um, skyscrapers. And uh, the corals, they do exactly the same. They, um, there's corals that have a branching structure. They, they go, yeah, they make a vertical structure. Um, but there are also corals, different species, that, um, that yeah, they're encrusting corals, so they spread more horizontally. And we have the same. We have uh, low-rise buildings. Uh, another similarity could be that the algae living together with the corals, they photosynthesize, producing sugar to the um, to the to the coral, they give that to the coral, which could be considered as paying rent for protection in the small skeleton. We do the same thing. We pay our landlord, and in return, we are allowed to live in the house. So these are just a few examples that show that um, the structures of ecosystems and human societies are quite similar, and it helps us uh, understanding the relationship between organisms. So at this moment, I would like to um, remind you that in your screen, um, you, uh, you can find a uh, call to action. And you can, uh, by clicking on this, you can register for the uh, Terra and Aqua magazine, uh, a magazine that often um, deals with ecological topics. And if you want to subscribe, you can do so after the webinar. So what have we discussed so far before we're uh, taking the next step from ecology to dredging? We talked about that every organism um, in an ecosystem has a function and other organisms depend on this organism fulfilling that function, so it comes with responsibility. Humans are part of ecosystems as well and therefore human activities come with responsibility. So the question we're going to talk about now is which responsibility comes with dredging? That's a good question, Astrid. Thank you. Um, but before we, um, that we come to that, uh, we should ask ourselves why we dredge or work within these environments in the first place. Um, more than 50% of human population live within uh, 80 kilometers of the coast and due to human development and growing economies, uh, marine construction and dredging uh, continues to change and impact these coasts um, and its ecosystems, such as salt marshes or mangroves, coral systems or, uh, or sea grasses, due to harbor expansions or um, housing projects, uh, etc. And these changes are inevitable, uh, but from an po ecological point of view, uh, there are two ways uh, of looking uh, 
uh, how you can perform these actions. So you could do this not in harmony with the environment, or you can do this in harmony with the environment, meaning uh, that you dredge within or work within the limits uh, of the ecosystems at that moment and not changing uh, the nature and the interactions uh, between these organisms. Um, the challenge there is uh, to find a balance um, and finding the, work, uh, the, the right work method for a particular place in a particular time. Um, this requires a thorough understanding of ecology and dredging and, um, and social uh, and economic uh, aspects. And ecologists cannot do this alone, but contractors can also not do this alone, or regulators for that matter. And this can only be achieved uh, through close collaboration uh, with clients, contractors, uh, in an early stage. Uh, by understanding each other's functions and goals and respecting uh, each other's uh, work methods and the bandwidth of the organisms that uh, live in the environment, um, including humans, um, a practical and realistic uh, eco-friendly design is achievable. Um, this is not an easy task, and, uh, but it is necessary if we do want to protect the environment uh, and allowing uh, continuation of infrastructural development and uh, economic growth. Uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, it has been introduced in the approach also known as Building with Nature, EcoShape, uh, a project that has been organized by Dutch dredging contractors. Um, from uh, 2008, uh, ecologists and consultants, dredging contractors have been working to, uh, together on this, uh, on this concept. And, um, and have gained valued insights uh, on the relations uh, between dredging activities and marine uh, organisms. Uh, the aim of the collaboration uh, program is uh, to, develop, uh, to develop soft hydro, um, hydraulic infrastructure which combine uh, functions and purposes um, are, which are built in harmony with, the, with its surrounding using its natural dynamics and creating new opportunities uh, for nature uh, which are accepted by many different stakeholders. Um, this is a paradigm shift uh, from building in nature to the building of nature, like uh, bird islands or uh, new intertidal systems, uh, towards building with nature, uh, where we use natural forces uh, to our advantage. A good example of this is the construction of the sand engine in front of uh, the Dutch coast, uh, where we have placed uh, a large uh, sand buffer in the in the dynamic uh, coastal uh, system and where tides and currents um, uh, redistribute uh, the material uh, along the coast in order to strengthen the Dutch coast. Uh, the program uh, is a collaboration of uh, Dutch partners, uh, as you see on this, on this sheet, uh, and was initiated by Boscalis and Van Oort. And currently uh, plans are being made uh, for a sequel of this Building with Nature program. Um, Building with Nature has provided understanding of ecosystem functioning. It has um, uh, gained data on how uh, design construction works uh, and how to design uh, construction works and, and uh, stimulate development uh, with, for, and around uh, these ecosystems. It has also given us uh, insights in how to dredge in harmony with nature. Uh, working together and sharing uh, knowledge and respecting each other's goals and key um, uh, goals and work methods um, is key in combining environmental conservation and human development. Uh, this is not a static situation and uh, through new insights we'll be able uh, to interact with one, e one another in a harmonious way. Look at us sitting here together um, and it needs a continuous effort. However, a growing insight also comes with growing responsibility, a responsibility that contractors have started to take already by um, employing environmental engineers in order to find suitable work methods in sensitive ecosystems. And this action should now preferably be expanded by collaboration in an earlier phase, an earlier stage when our clients, um, consultants, uh, regulators are setting up environmental assessments, making the designs, um, applying for permits. Um, this development has come with, with changes of the traditional ways for tendering, designing and execution of dredging projects. Um, and for a lot of people, changes are often perceived with skepticism and fear. 
But change also opens the door for new opportunities. And just as the Chinese character for crisis is composed of two characters, um, the one representing danger, but the other one representing opportunity. And this is how we see this new mindset as well, a uh, new way for lots of opportunities. So to wrap it up, um, by only investing in knowledge, um, contractors can keep up with changing regulations. Um, this has taken place for some years now and will most likely continue. Um, but by cooperation and innovation in an early stage, uh, contractors can contribute to the change of regulation and apply these regulations in practice, um, in practical and feasible eco-friendly designs. And that's what we're aiming for. So we, um, yeah, have, we have some time to, uh, to answer questions now. I see that we have a first uh, a question. The question is, um, I think this is referring to the uh, table where we compared corals with uh, um, human societies. Wouldn't a grazer be recycling rather than a garbage company? That is a good. I think uh, it's a very, <laughs> very, very sharp. Um, yeah. But I think also garbage companies recycle nowadays. So yeah. Perhaps yeah. that is. Um, a, but it it would be a good. Um, yeah. A good yeah. point. Um, for people who don't know, there's a grazing fish that eat the algae, uh, the the waste of the uh, on the reef, and yeah, they're they're poop, their pellets are um, being converted into uh, nutrients that are um, accessible for other um, animals. That we uh, have a next question. Yeah. So um, what can the concept of ecosystem services bring the dredging industry? That is a good question. I saw that there was a, a, a EIDC um, um, an article on yeah it, um, it, it is an article but I've um, it is a good question and uh, maybe we can um, uh, discuss this uh, more uh, when we uh, um, maybe after uh, after this webinar and come yeah. back to that uh, uh, to this yeah. um, to this person uh, uh, via email oh uh, we mm -hmm. have another question <laughs> um, isn't so uh, the question is, uh, isn't the, uh, an environmental design uh, the client's responsibility? Uh, that is a, 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 it's a good question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, in, in the traditional um, way of dredging, uh, we would say, um, yes, it's the client's design. It's, it's client's responsibility. Uh, we're just signing the contract and uh, yeah, that's it. But we should be aware of our responsibility because um, okay, for instance, if you uh, if somebody uh, tells you to uh, yeah to hit Heidi, um, is is it is it my responsibility if I hit her? Is it a person's uh, responsibility if he asks me that? We should all think for ourselves. And now that we see that um, everything is related and that we are part of the system from an ecological point of view, it would make sense to take your own responsibility. Um, yeah, another question is, uh, what if there is no way to dredge in harmony? Should we stop working all together? Okay, well, that is a good question. Uh, I've thought about that as, uh, as well. It, um, I think it's, uh, we are not saying that we, um, uh, what we should do or what dredging companies or any company in the world should do. If it, uh, this is just actually what what we feel um, from an ecological point of view uh, what people should think about when uh, when there are uh, uh, when they are thinking about uh, doing a project and um, actually the way um, we we think that it's possible to do this in a in a ecological and harmonious way um, anything to add no, not at the moment. <laughs> okay. Well, we have another question. <laughs> I have another question. Um, which mitigating measures can be applied when working around coral reefs? Okay, that's a that's a good one. Well, the I think the of course the the best way to mitigate impacts is is to prevent impacts, and that of course would be um, if you're already involved in a in the beginning of a project and where you can try to find a, a way 
to avoid impacts by, by making an optimal design, um, okay, that would be the best uh, mitigating measure. But yeah, for instance, if it is um, not possible, then um, there could be um, adaptive monitoring where you study the area, you study the impacts of your work uh, on the environment and adapt your um, work method um, as a result of that. Yeah, and by, yeah. And you can only do this by monitoring. So monitoring would be uh, yeah. uh, would be an essential part of this um, of this adaptive monitoring or management um, uh, strategy. And then you also yeah. And there are a lot of uh, things we can do uh, to manage uh, the the work method uh, which is chosen. Of course, first of all, you choose the work method which is the most ecological friendly within uh, the contract boundaries. And, and then you see what um, what you can do on a uh, mm. with monitoring and the adaptiveness of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, we have one uh, one more question. Okay. Um, why is there no such thing as competition? Well, yeah. As I said in the introduction, there. Uh, um, of course, there is introduction of a uh, competition on a on, on a small scale. For instance, uh, there are um, two lions um, fighting for the uh, for the same type of food, and yeah, they will at that moment they will be competitors. But um, as we also show that everything is related, um, they also need each other because when you only have one lion or one fish or one human um, you wouldn't you wouldn't survive um, you need other organisms to uh, to to do so and uh, yeah somebody explained it to me uh, quite recently and he said um, what would uh, a one soccer club for instance Ajax be without another soccer club Feyenoord um, they need each other to play a game to uh, compete with each other, so there is competition. But in the end, you need different clubs to make a make a football league, and I think that's also how it is in nature. Um, you, you play your part, and and yeah, you have some struggle because you have some competition. But you should always uh, look at the the overall picture, and then there is um, yeah cooperation. Okay, we have uh, we have another question for: uh, Is there research? Uh, on uh, more uh, environmental friendly dredging uh, techniques uh, in the works. Um, well, there has been a lot of, um, um, of development in that. Uh, our um, uh, suction hopper dredgers, uh, they, they have had a lot of change uh, over time uh, due to optimizing uh, production uh, within, uh, within the equipment itself um, so that the spill uh, which you lose uh, when you dredge uh, the sand um, is uh, is more optimized. Um, that is good for um, for the production and thus for uh, f for uh, for the company. But also it's good for the for the system because less uh, spill or less um, uh, sediment um, is uh, placed within the um, in within the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we do we actually oh, both uh, companies do a lot of research on. Um, uh, on uh, how um, uh, the overflow system uh, works and what kind of spill um, is, um, uh, or, or what what the sedimentation and the spill is from from this kind of uh, from the different types of equipment, so that we can uh, better determine uh, our work method, um, and there. There is also um, maybe some other systems where uh, you dredge with a, a closed bucket, but that has been uh, that has been in the in the market for a, for a long time. When you when you dredge and uh, you you lessen the spill uh, when you close uh, close the lid on you know, on your dredge bucket. So I hope this answers um, your question. Uh, we have a very enthusiastic question here from somebody. Woohoo! Cool seminar, ladies. Question: Wouldn't you think that only engineers, uh, but also managers, should have an ecological background? Well, that is a good question. Yeah, I think Thank you for a your really good question. <laughs> your enthusiasm. Um, 
Yeah, maybe the answer, uh, it would be easy to say yes, but I think, yeah, most of all, um, um, it's important that you can uh, place yourself in the position of somebody else and understand um, the need for protecting the uh, environment. And you don't always have to agree with, with, with somebody else's um, reasons, but as long as you work together in finding the best way of, um, yeah, of collaborating and, and, and meeting each other's goals, I think that would be, um, that would be my answer. And yeah, so you don't need to have an ecological background. I think if there is communication with ecological um, scientists or yeah, people like yeah. us, then yeah, you can teach each other. And we are here now, uh, and I think that uh, that this is a good opportunity to um, to also uh, look have our managers or have managers uh, anywhere look at these uh, at this seminar or webinar and uh, and say, okay, this is actually what ecology uh, is and how we can um, use it to our advantage or at least um, um, maybe see how. Um, well, we can work with it and not uh, uh, against it. So, so this mm. would be also the goal from this uh, webinar. We have another... Uh, yeah, we got lots of questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you enforce no dredging in protected biodiversity sites? It seems like marine protected areas are not protected the same as national parks, uh, where mining would not be allowed, for example. Ooh, I, I wouldn't think that would be a question for us, but for our clients. But mm -hmm. if our client would ask us this, then if we can't, if wow, well, this is a this is yeah, a difficult uh, question. But maybe we can maybe take our time a little bit uh, more uh, yeah, after this I webinar to, yeah. to to discuss this further and and come back to uh, to this uh, yeah. okay. to this question. Uh, sorry. Don't you think that building with nature still serves as building without harming nature? How about using biochemical processes to contribute in achieving the infrastructural goal? Biochemical processes. Um, Ooh, um, these are good questions, people. <laughs> <laughs> um, still serves. As, I don't think, um, but. Okay, let, let me be start with the first question, uh, because the first question was, do you think that building with nature still serves as building without harming nature? And um, I think that it's always, if we try to change something uh, anywhere, that um, nature uh, is changed, not so much harmed, but changed, yeah. uh, because everything changes. Also, um, also nature changes by itself through through nature itself and we uh, as being part of nature uh, as humans uh, change things um, but we also want to drive a car and we also want to have economic growth in areas that do not have that at this moment so yeah. it's like I, I can see how what your question uh, why it, where it comes from uh, but I, I yeah. well building without harming nature yeah, maybe uh, maybe it still is, but if you look at at the um, the the, the um, example which we gave uh, as the sand engine, um, that is uh, definitely building with nature, using processes um, um, to our advantage, and mm -hmm. coming uh, putting one big pile of sand there once, and not returning every year to do um, a supplementary. Um, mm -hmm. um, reclamation. So, and and we use the the, the forces um, of nature to uh, to spread the sand and and strengthen our coastline. So that is one example. But uh, I think there are yeah. more. I think if I may add to that, I think the more we understand um, all these different interactions between organisms, um, the more we can apply them in our work, and the more um, yeah natural or yeah, without harming, um, our, the projects can be executed. And I think also uh, using biochemical processes, if we understand exactly how they work, we can um, try to apply them, thinking about, uh, yeah, what is it? 
Oh, I can't find the Dutch, the, the, the English name right now, so maybe it's... But it, it, is, it has to do everything with understanding um, the situation and applying it, translating it to, uh, to a work method. And yeah, it takes time and uh, it's a continuous process, but I think that is the aim. Okay, and I, I don't think that um, I don't have the answer to the to the second question in this question. Uh, mm -hmm. How about using biochemical processes? Um, uh, maybe this qu this uh, question near can uh, can maybe um, uh, add some more uh, light on this uh, or shed some light mo yeah. more on this uh, after uh, after this webinar, and we can discuss it maybe uh, mm -hmm. some uh, some more. Um, I do have uh, uh, another question on. Uh, uh, you've talked about the impact of dredging and uh, focusing on the dredging side, uh, but what about the disposal side? Uh, are there any recommended depths or disposal characteristics uh, to minimize the impact? Um, and um, it, it all depends on the situation. I think every it should be a case by case study. Definitely. And and there's not one answer saying okay, yeah, it has to be this depth or. Um, you have to understand the um, environment at that specific location in that specific moment of time because everything is changes, changing. So it would be a little bit difficult to say if there is a recommended depth or disposal characteristic. But I think it's, it's, it's good to say that when we look at a project, we look at it, uh, look at the overall project. So not only the dredging site, but also uh, the disposal site. And, yeah. and we can, uh, within our work methods, um, um, choose where uh, the less sensitive areas are um, on um, on where the impact is going to be. So uh, maybe we choose for a work method for dredging in 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 a, a port, and um, and the port itself uh, doesn't have any sensitive receivers. Um, so we we choose to overflow within the port and have the the most impact. Uh, there and if we dispose of our uh, uh, of our sediment um, out of the port, where maybe sensitive areas are um, are there, uh, that there will be only uh, sand and not so much fine sand, which will distribute uh, will be uh, distributed even uh, further, uh, so we can minimize the impact outside the port. So I think it's good to know that we sh um, we look at the whole. Um, a project and the processes uh, all around uh, to choose the, the best workable uh, option. So, you have another question? Yeah, we still have lots of questions. Uh, in Falmouth, Jamaica, you have transplanted a large amount of coral to mitigate dredging impacts and the survival of the transplanted coral is well documented. But what is the state of any remaining coral in or near the dredge area? Um, well it's it's yeah. a little bit difficult to, to, uh, to answer this one. I don't know exactly uh, what you mean with near the dredging area. Um, there was, uh, in, in the footprint of the uh, access channel, um, there was coral. Um, that was the coral that was relocated to nearby uh, reef flats, n nearby reef areas. And um, it was placed in between um, the other corals, at, at the patches where um, coral was um, gone um, after um, a hurricane. There was some damage, and those were the, the locations where it was placed. Um, yeah, and that was also the area that we studied for um, survival of the relocated corals. So, yeah, we looked at the whole uh, the whole area and. and that looked fine, and that's the what is described in the article. So, that's the, as best as I can answer this question. Um, a lot of questions are, are coming in, and uh, we will publish uh, the answers on the EI, EIDC uh, website and provide uh, all participants uh, with this link. So, um, so then, uh, that is it. Yeah. We have time for uh, one or two more questions. Um, what is the most significant ecological impact from dredging? Well, as I said, um, you have to look at it um, in a case-by-case -case basis because if there is an area with, uh, for instance, mussel beds, um, then the, yeah, the most uh, 
significant ecological impact would be smothering or direct removal through vessels. But if you have an area with only sea turtles, then maybe uh, it could be yeah, this visual disturbance uh, through the ships or um, collisions. So there is not one such thing as a significant ecological impact. Um, I think that uh, yeah, per, yeah, per, per project, uh, there are, uh, you can't make a project without an EIA or a MER, as we call it in, in, in Holland. And um, these ecological impacts are also um, uh, on, a, on a project by project basis. Yeah. Uh, we look at them as, as the environmental engineers from, uh, from, from our companies. We look at these impacts and we, uh, we, we look at them in a way of what our work method is going to be. And are these impacts, will these impacts be the same? And uh, in this way, we can, um, 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 yeah, look at the uh, at the impact. But if we, and that is actually why we want to be involved in an early stage, mm -hmm. uh, because if you um, an EIA is uh, most of the time based on on maybe a uh, a work method which with which the consultant thinks that the dredging company is going to work, but maybe we can. We can, when we uh, enter in, a, in an earlier stage, uh, we can make it more practical or uh, we can make it more eco-friendly because maybe a consultant hasn't thought of different work mm -hmm. methods or different strategies. And um, I think we should uh, trust each other that, um, that this cooperation uh, can, uh, can exist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is a difficult question uh, to, to answer, um, um, but it's project by project based. Yeah, and it also has to do with, with, with the work method, the amount of time that the project is taking place. If it's only uh, dredging for a week, then it might not be um, yeah, a whole lot of impact. But if, if the project takes place for three years, then it, it gets a whole uh, different, uh, everything comes in a whole different light. We have another question yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> dredging projects also and did quite often create new biotopes. How to predict and evaluate that against conser conservatism? conservatism? Well, I think that it's uh, if you if you talk to uh, to three different ecologists, then they will give you three different answers because uh, some ecologists or biologists or um, they want to preserve what we have now. Um, some ecologists are for um, uh, the development of nature, and and um, you go from a from from a from a biotope. To another biotope, and that would be okay as well. If you if you say um, here was a beach, but we make a, n a, a nice new uh, area with the pools and and where fish go in and out with the yeah. tide, um, is that a decline or is that an increase? Yeah. I can't say because I think it's both pretty and uh, uh, but um, that doesn't mm. really matter. If um, it is a change, and some people are for change, and some people are against change and I think if you um, if you discuss um, the project within an early stage with all different kinds of stakeholders yeah. that everybody will have a different opinion but when you discuss it you will maybe come to to one uh, to one answer yeah. um, well, I think we have our link with ecosystem services here now when you define what uh, a certain area what it's used for what what value does it have um, yeah it is basically an agreement what do you agree what 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 is worth more um, yeah it all depends on on the people that live there the um, the habitat that you have right now and then the things you want and then you can, yeah, you can look back in history and you see what has happened. Um, so you know roughly in certain conditions this could happen. And you have your ecological studies where you look at the interactions. How, does, how, do, how do the organisms work? Um, yeah. What relations do they have? And then you can make a, yeah, you can make a, f a forecast for what could happen. Um, but it's also what you want to happen because, yeah, as we said, there is always change and, um, yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, the, um, the questions that are coming in uh, right now will be uh, placed online on the website and we will uh, try to answer them uh, as good as possible. And, uh, yeah, we... Uh, 
we would also like to uh, remind you that uh, on your screen you can uh, you, you'll see a call to action. Um, it is an evaluation for IADC, and we would like to ask you um, if you'd be so nice to uh, fill this out. Um, it enables IADC to um, improve the quality of these webinars, and uh, so we can learn from it. And that would be um, really nice. And we hope that uh, we were able to give you uh, a better idea of where ecology and dredging meet each other. Over the years, we have learned a lot already, but we also still have uh, a long way to go. I must say, and perhaps Heidi uh, agrees with me, that at times it feels like we're taking one step forward and, and two steps back. But um, yeah, we're on our way to dredging in harmony with nature. It's a continuous process and it takes a lot of effort, but we're all working hard on this. And the most important thing is that we keep trying to understand um, each other's needs and goals. And we do this together. It gives us a daily challenge. Um, maybe for us it's sometimes more of a quest. Um, it's not always easy, but it is the reason why we both chose to work for a dredging contractor. And it is a very interesting place to be as an ecologist. We, uh, yeah, we would like thank to uh, thank IADC for inviting us and giving us a chance to share our thoughts with you. And thank you all for watching. Thank you. Bye. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this webinar on ecology and dredging. This is the second webinar organized by IADC. The first webinar um, is still available on the, on the website and this webinar will also be made available on the website um, within a few days from now.